Woman's Mysteries, Ancient and Modern by M. Esther Hardy. Chapter 1 Myth and the Modern Mind. Not so many years ago, the title of this chapter would have evoked a smile, for while myths might be studied as part of the strange world of the primitive, they could have no place in relation to the mind of modern man. During the 19th century and the early part of the 20th, when the most advanced thought was concerned in exploring the external world and attention was directed almost exclusively to the objective realm, all subjective factors were considered only a hindrance to the search of truth. Scientists, with few exceptions, pay attention to the inner psychical realm only that they might be sure to exclude it from their observations. They differentiated science from imagination and objective observation from subjective guesses. In this way, chemistry evolved from alchemy, astronomy from astrology, and geography from the dim foreshadowings of the picture maps, which made up a sort of pre-geography. The geologist, with his instruments of exact measurement, replaced the water finder with his witch hazel. The physician, with his laboratory test, replaced not only the medicine man, but the old family physician as well, whose skill rested more on a curious sixth sense than on exact knowledge. Occasionally, the searcher for objective truth had to admit, however, that the guess of earlier centuries came extraordinarily near the truth. When this happened, he usually dismissed the matter as due to coincidence, never suspecting that the subjective guess might have a meaning in a different realm from the one he was considering. Today, however, we begin to realize that these things must be looked at a little differently. It is as if the impressions of the world which crowd in upon human consciousness were a matrix, an ore, from which man has gradually extracted organized knowledge. Objective science is such an extract. All those factors which do not contribute directly to objective knowledge and were excluded by the older scientific attitude form a residue discarded in the hundred and fifty years just past, being accounted only as a slag. But another distillation process has already been initiated by a new kind of scientist, whose concern is not only with the material world. From the slag discarded by the last century, these workers are seeking treasures of another character. Their search is also for truth, but now their definition of truth includes the subjective, the non-material. The strange ideas of alchemy or astrology the superstitions of the witch hazel or the magic filter, as well as the personal equation which haunts the most exact observer, these all need explanation. Psychologists are asking whence do superstitions arise? They can hardly be explained by spontaneous generation, and the physical scientists assert that they are not a part of the objective material. Astrological myths, for instance, have nothing to do with the sun the moon and stars as physical objects, yet these myths are universal among primitive peoples and the ancients. They even persist among ourselves, but here they show themselves no longer as direct superstitions or myths, but rather as inner states or attitudes of mind which can be observed in inexplicable changes of feeling and mood not to be accounted for by the external situation but which are often nonetheless referred to the state of the weather or to some other external variable, as though there were a direct relation of cause and effect between the two. While if we turn to the background of consciousness, we find that ideas, not unlike the primitive's myth, underlie the feelings and moods of modern man. In his musing and dreams, in his poetry and fantasies, these ancient thought feelings hold unquestioned sway who has not at some time been profoundly affected by the sight of the full moon rising over the sea, affected, that is, in a way which cannot be explained simply along aesthetic lines. Though even if his emotion were merely due to the aesthetic combination of light and shade, the argument would still stand, for there is more in such an experience than just the objective material fact. There is also a subjective experience which in a man's life is perhaps more important and more powerful than the scientific knowledge of the nature of moonlight. For the sentient human being, with thousands of years of evolution behind him, may be touched by the scene so that dim memories of ancient nights awake within him, enabling him, perhaps, 
to act on an emotion which transcends his little everyday self, resulting, it may be, in a poem he could not have conceived in the hard light of day, or perhaps giving him courage to yield to a but half-realized love whose acceptance can change the whole course of his life. This inner or subjective aspect of experience is not nonsense, nor is it only superstition. Material science, it is true, has disregarded it, but it remains a potent factor in human life. Indeed, the discarded element contains that subjective or psychical factor which constitutes spirit. The scientists of the 19th century as skeptic or agnostic denied the existence of spirit. This is hardly to be wondered at for, as we have seen, he eliminated as irrelevant all evidences of its presence. But men in a more naive state of culture may know such distinction between objective fact and subjective superstition. The subjective or psychical factor was perceived by them as though it were a part of the object. There was no relation that these added facts were a part of the observer. Indeed, there was no differentiation between objective and subjective. The qualities which the object possessed per se and those which were assumed to exist on account of its effect on the observer were not differentiated. The subjective element was projected into the matter. An example may make this distinction clearer. If a man is colorblind and matches a piece of red cloth with a piece of green, we do not say this is nonsense. We make instead a judgment about his powers of perception, namely, that he suffers from red-green colored blindness. What he sees in the external world gives information about himself, which is correct even while his observation of the object is false, as judged by the consensus of people with normal sight. But we should also realize that this observation gives information about those people who see red and green as different. If colorblind people were in the majority, the tables would be turned and the ability to differentiate red and green would be considered an abnormality, which would in turn be used as a test of the subject, not of the object. It is our unconsciousness which makes us say that the cloth is red. That is to say, it is our superstition. H.G. Wells took his problem as the theme of the country of the blind, which depicts a country with a general limitation. In this case, blindness is taken as the basis of morality. There, the greatest crime was to see. Sight was hedged about with the strictest and most dread taboo. To know that which others did not know was impious, a crime with the deepest dye. This story is not without special significance at the beginning of a book which attempts to pierce the veil of unconsciousness surrounding a subject protected, until recently, from all inquiry by the most passionate fanaticism. On investigating any superstition, two similar factors will always be found, one in the object, and the illustration used above this is the red factor having to do with the power of the object to reflect certain waves of light, and the other in the subject, in this case the capacity of the retina to respond in a particular way to waves of a certain wavelength, and not to respond in the same way to any other waves. The naive observer naturally is not aware of these two factors. He takes himself and his subjective capacities for granted, and instead of realizing them, endows the magic with qualities which are only partly objective. That is, he creates a superstition about the object which arises from a confusion between what is objective and what is subjective. Whenever the subjective factor is inadequately recognized, this is the inevitable result, for the unrealized subjective element is projected to the object and is interpreted by the observer as external fact. For instance, the astrologers and alchemists made most careful observations of the external world, but they interpreted their findings without differentiating the subjective factor, which came from the unconscious, and which contains just the part of a man's psyche of which he is unaware. In much the same way, we also fail to take account of our psychological peculiarities and characteristics. We are ordinarily entirely ignorant about them, unconscious even that they exist, or if a dim awareness of our psychological lack comes to us, we turn away from fuller knowledge. For as in Wells's country of the blind, it is taboo to see more than other people. 
These subjective factors, however, are potent psychical entities. They belong to the totality of our being. They cannot be destroyed. We may ignore them, repress them, but they continue to exist. So long as they are unrecognized, outcast from our conscious life, they will come between us and all the objects we view, and our whole world will be either distorted or illuminated by the superadded subjective factor. Thus the object is altered, so that what we perceive is never really the object itself, but always our view of the object. The scientific method deals with this dilemma by eliminating the subjective and psychological factors as far as possible and then concerning itself with the objective or relatively objective data which remain. Such a process excludes the human element and results necessarily in a mechanical concept of life. Indeed, it produced the machine age where value was largely measured in terms of available physical energy. Yet if this is so, it is strange to recall how satisfied our predecessors were with this mechanistic view of life, for we in the present generation are increasingly dissatisfied with it. Those men of the 19th century had an enthusiasm for science, for objective or factual truth which was religious in its intensity. There was nothing mechanistic about them, in spite of their own theories. Their concern with scientific truth was like a new faith. The explanation for this lies in the fact that during the phase of mechanical expansion their living spirit was occupied with devising ever more and more ingenious methods of conquering ever wider fields in which their scientific ingenuity could find scope. In other words, the enterprise they were really concerned with was the expansion of their own powers and the increase of conscious control of the objective world. Their aim was, unknown to themselves, a psychological one. They were really concerned with the subjective factor, though this they did not realize, for that which they thought they had eliminated so carefully had escaped their observations and once again motivated their enthusiasm. Our dissatisfaction has been emphasized by the world problems of the past few years, during which it has become more and more evident that happiness and the fulfillment of life are not to be found through mass production and the discovery of new sources of energy supply. This dissatisfaction shows itself not only in general anxiety, but also in neuroses and unhappiness, and in a sense of frustration, a lack of any real enthusiasm. In particular, are we dissatisfied with the character and quality of our human relationships? Our fathers were neither able to make more satisfactory relationships than we are, or they were less sensitive to disharmony or anyway. Whatever the reason, there is no doubt about the large part unhappiness and unneurosis dependent on unsatisfactory human relationships plays in a dissatisfaction with life from which so many people suffer. The life of today is empty and sterile, and we look for renewal, whether we want to or not, from that source of spiritual awakenings which lies within for our science has proved itself strangely impotent in the face of a threatened breakdown in our culture. In order to gain a new vantage point from which a fresh world philosophy may perhaps be built up, a renewed contact with the deeper levels of human nature is needed so that a really vital relation may be established with the laws or principles which activate humanity. Only through such a renewing experience can we hope to be able to bridge the chasm which has opened up before our Western civilization. In the past, when a breakdown of morality and economics, of world philosophy, confronted a civilization, it seemed that nothing could be done except to reinforce the ideals on which the culture was built, whether these were materialistic or spiritual. But in most cases, recovery was impossible. The ideals had carried the civilization as far as they could. Further expansion along those lines was impossible, and the culture crumbled. Barbarians surged in. The Dark Ages supervened until, through the succeeding centuries, a new culture was evolved, not, however, from the remnants of the old, but arising spontaneously from new soil, from the inferior people who invaded and destroyed their civilized and cultural predecessors. Some believe that this fate is about to overtake our Western civilization, 
and that those things which we and our ancestors have built up are about to be destroyed while our values will go into the discard replaced by others which are not values to us but represent those powers and impulses which have most strenuously been repressed and denied. Perhaps this is the fate that is in store for us, but perhaps another solution of the problem may be available. The highly developed is always replaced by the underdeveloped, the civilized by the barbarian. This is the inevitable course of history. Today, however, a new factor has come into play. Through the study of the unconscious, we have found a way to be reconciled with the barbarian within ourselves. The world drama can be, and indeed not infrequently is, played out within the individual. Power and prestige abstracted from the highly developed parts of the psyche are applied to the more lowly parts so that they may be educated, may be raised from the position of barbarism and degradation. But this process the individual can pass from an exclusively intellectual and rational attitude to one where the forces latent in the unconscious are given due recognition and are thus no longer in stark opposition to conscious attitude if this peaceful revolution within the individual could be accomplished in a sufficient number of people might it not be that a renewal of life even in the whole of western civilization could take place without the necessity of passing through a phase of destruction and barbarism. For the revolution would take place within, in individuals. It would be a psychological happening and would make unnecessary the overthrow of a one-sided civilization by people representing the excluded elements. For this reason, it is essential that we study the unconscious in order to reconstruct our attitudes in accordance with the neglected forces which still manifest themselves there. Foremost among these neglected values is the subjective factor, which is deliberately eliminated in the attempt to differentiate the object as a thing in itself. The neglect of the inner or subjective aspect of life has led, particularly for women, to a certain falsification of her living values. For example, in the conventional judgment of the past, a woman had one prime adaptation to make, the adaptation of wife and mother. If she married well, she succeeded. If she failed to marry, she was all too likely to be considered a failure. The success or defeat of her whole life even might be measured in the general estimation of the world by this external or objective standard alone, and indeed being married, the success or failure of her marriage itself was judged also by external standards. If any difficulty arose in her relation to her husband, her tendency was, and still often is, to seek for an external remedy. It is not uncommon, for instance, to hear that a woman has tried to heal an emotional breach with her husband by taking a trip or redecorating the home. The subjective side of the problem is, in such cases, discounted and allowed to vent itself only in moods or bad temper or in some neurotic disturbance. In homes where the external standard rules and the subjective side of life is ignored, these neurotic manifestations are not taken seriously into account. For the most part, they are even disregarded as mere emotionality, nervousness, or little weaknesses of temperament. In more recent times, a woman faced with home problems of this character, perhaps a badly maladjusted child, would learn something of modern psychology and child training and try by applying what she had learned objectively to accomplish by an external technique what would really follow naturally if she did not but know how to apply her own feminine feelings and reactions to the situation. But in so far as her own subjective life is disregarded, this natural effect of her being is nullified and she is left with no resource but a mechanical technique, at best a poor substitute for a living reality. Today the success or failure of a woman's life is not judged to anything like the same extent on the exclusive criterion of marriage. Her adaptation to life may now be made in various ways, each of which offers some opportunity for solving the problems of work of social relations, 
and of her emotional needs. If, however, in order to gain discipline and development on all sides of her personality, she seeks to make an adjustment to life which is not one-sided but is as many faceted as her own nature, her task is a most complex one. For while the stirrings within, which require a field of activity in the outer objective world, are accepted by herself and others as legitimate, other longings, which also have their origin deep within her being and which seek for a spiritual and subjective fulfillment, are not so generally acknowledged. The manifestation of these needs is frequently considered to be little more than moods, whims, emotionality, superstition, and so forth. So pressing have these subjective problems become, however, in many instances, that the psychological factor which the older physical scientist eliminated is now being eagerly sought out and analyzed. Once again, the stone which the builders rejected is becoming the headstone of the corner. For every human being has not only impulses and instincts which need life live collectively in the social group for their satisfaction, but other instincts and impulses also which urge him to find himself as a unique individual. Each one has a nature which seeks for love and relationship, and also there is embedded in everyone the necessity to strive for impersonal truth. These opposing tendencies are expressions of the duality of human nature, which is both objective and subjective. In all human beings, such an opposition is at work and leads inevitably to conflict. In the Western world of today, this conflict is most severe and bears hardest upon woman because Western civilization lays a special emphasis on the value of the outer, and this fits in more nearly with man's nature than with woman's. The feminine spirit is more subjective, more concerned with feelings and relationships than with the laws and principles of the outer world, and so it happens that the conflict between outer and inner is usually more devastating for women than for men. There is another reason why this problem is a particularly urgent one for women today. This is related to the recent development of the masculine side of woman's nature which has been so marked a feature of recent years. This masculine development is definitely related to her life in the world of affairs. In the majority of cases, it is even sought as a prerequisite for earning a living in the world, practicing a profession, or following a trade. The change of character, which has accompanied this evolution, does not stop at the professional part of a woman's life but affects her whole personality and has caused profound changes in her relation to herself and to others. But as long as the masculine side of woman's nature was allowed to remain as it was in the past, undeveloped and unconscious, it either slept unrecognized or it functioned in a purely instinctive fashion. The recent awakening of woman from her long apathy has brought to the fore latent powers which, naturally enough, she is eager to develop and apply in life, both for her own satisfaction and advantage and to increase her contribution to the life of the group. This step forward in conscious development is not without its difficulties and drawbacks. Woman has moved away from the old, well-established woman's way of conduct and psychological adaptation and finds herself today beset by problems which neither she herself nor the pioneer women who initiated the movement for women's emancipation foresaw. These changes have produced for woman an unavoidable inner conflict between the urge to express herself through work as a man does and the inner necessity to live in accordance with her own ancient feminine nature. This conflict seems to condition the whole experience of life for all those modern women who are at, at all aware of themselves as conscious individuals. For them, a one-sided life is not sufficient. The conflict between the opposing tendencies of masculine and feminine within them has to be faced. They cannot resume the feminine values in the old instinctive and unconscious way. Through acquiring a new degree of consciousness, they have cut themselves off from the easy road of nature. If they are to get in touch with their lost feminine side, it must be at the hard road of a conscious adaptation. 
the problems of adaptation arising from woman's newly acquired consciousness of duality have necessarily to be dwelt with in their modern aspect. Yet the need for the reconciliation of these two parts of the woman's nature is an age-old problem. It is only in its application to practical life that the modern note is struck. We have but to look below the veneer of modern life to find the problem on a deeper level. There, it is not a question of how a woman may adapt in the world of work and of love in such a way as to give due weight to both sides of her nature, but it is rather a matter of how she adapts to the masculine and feminine principles which rule her being from within. Here she has to turn to that discarded subjective material which to the objective scientists of the 19th century was only superstition or moodiness. In these terms, the problem is no longer one of the 20th century alone. It is one which has concerned women from the most primitive times. I do not mean to imply, however, that women of the past have been consciously occupied with this problem as an intellectual question. Psychological consciousness of that kind is a phenomenon, peculiar perhaps to today. For those who were or still are less advanced in psychological evolution, such questioning is not at all necessary. Only for advanced moderns has it become a necessity of life to question everything and to seek to understand. Nevertheless, this problem has dominated much of the inner activity and thought of men and women throughout the ages, as the mass of myth and legend dealing with the subject bears witness. For the experience of life which the centuries brought to primitive and antique man was consolidated into conventions and customs which formed and still form the basis for external conduct. Another kind of wisdom brought by this same experience was embodied by the intuitive insight of the race in myths and religions, particularly in religious mysteries and rituals, which do not formulate a consciously held intellectual knowledge or opinion, but instead shadow forth an unconscious sense of how things are. The myths and rituals of ancient religions represent the naive projection of psychological realities. They are undistorted by rationalization, for in matters which deal with the spirit realm, that is, the psychological realm, primitive people and the people of antiquity did not think, they perceived, by an inner or intuitive sense, as indeed we still do today. Hence these products of the unconscious contain psychological material which is uncensored and from which a store of knowledge may be gleaned of an inner reality underlying the life of the group, which would otherwise be inaccessible to us. Jung has pointed out that myths and rituals represent the fantasy of the group and that this material may be interpreted psychologically by a method similar to that employed in the study of the unconscious products of individual men and women when it will yield information relating to the hidden psychological realities on which the group life is founded. Therefore, by an analysis of the dreams and fantasies of an individual, we can discover what psychological attitudes really underlie his conscious facade. What are his genuine motives? What is the true nature of his relations? This reality may not correspond at all to the idea of his inner state which he himself holds, his conscious ego may distort the facts and be self-deceived by desires and instincts for self-preservation, self-esteem, and the like. But in the unconscious, truth cannot be dissembled in this way. The unconscious can only mirror the actual facts and therefore cannot lie. For this reason, a dream or fantasy may tell the expert more about a man's real character than anything he himself can say. His dreams and fantasies show without bias his relation to his personal problem. In certain instances, they show much more than this, for, inasmuch as he is a child of his age and culture, his personal problem may well be but an individual version of a general or collective one. To the extent that this is so, his unconscious material will show the relations of psychological forces and tendencies in a general form, which would be applicable to many people still situated as he is but in dealing with dreams and fantasies we have always to bear in mind that we are studying a single individual whose personal circumstances will color the presentation of what 
may yet be a collective or general problem. Hence, we cannot unhesitatingly say that the dream or fantasy of an individual shows how things are in a general way, but only how they are in this case. Myths and rituals, however, represent the unconscious processes of whole tribes or races. They have been adapted to the common needs of countless generations by a process of conventionalization, through which the personal elements have been eliminated. There remains the general themes which are common to all the individuals of the group. The fact that equivalent myths and rituals are strikingly similar, even as to detail, in the cultures of widely separated peoples indicates that they represent general psychological themes which are true of humanity no matter where. And indeed, the dreams and fantasies of modern people occasionally show a similar generalized character of resembling ancient or primitive myths. This resemblance between the dream and some ancient myth may occur in cases where there is no knowledge of the existence of such a myth so that the dream cannot be explained as borrowing. It is a spontaneous creation of the unconscious. Jung first elaborated this theory in his Psychology of the Unconscious and has since added much to that first attempt to understand the personal problem of an individual by means of the collected images in his dreams. But he has done more than this, for he has shown how these collective images may occur in people whose personal problems depend on an unsolved collective adaptation. Practical experience of the unconscious of many people of very different caliber teaches that the dreams and fantasies tend to have this generalized or myth-like character in two classes of individuals. First, those people whose personal life has never yet emerged fully from its unconscious beginnings or has been swamped by collective material surging up from the depths of the unconscious. And second, the myth-like character may show itself also in the dreams of another class of people namely those whose personal problems have already been largely dealt with either by the experience of life itself or through analysis. This generalized character of dreams is thus found in people at the two extremes of development, those who have not yet achieved an individual life apart from the collective stream of inner images and those who have largely assimilated their personal problems and worked their way through to a wider viewpoint. In the case of those individuals who have not yet achieved a satisfactory personal life, but are still trailing clouds of glory, as it were, the object of analysis must first be to establish that which is lacking, namely a personal relation to the world. This situation and problem I shall not consider further here, but turn instead to those cases where an adequate personal life has been built up, and yet collective material breaks through into the dreams. While at the same time there is a serious dissatisfaction with the life which has been achieved. In such cases, the individual's problems cannot be understood if it is viewed only from the personal angle, for no human life consists only in the personal. To earn one's living, marry and beget children, and take one's place in the social group is not enough. Beyond this, each man and woman must acquire a broader understanding of life if he is not to be suffocated in the childishly personal. As civilized beings, it is necessary, as Jung has pointed out, to find for ourselves a worldview, which implies a more fundamental adaptation to the world, both in its outer and inner aspects, than is usually necessary to steer one's way through a small or provincial life, where an almost completely unconscious and instinctive functioning suffices. Many people, it is true, live and die on this plane hardly more aware of the stirrings of the spirit than animals or peasants. But those individuals whose dreams contain a preponderance of collective images are faced with the necessity of building for themselves a better worldview, and of concerning themselves with these general questions, whether they come in terms of outer problems, such as social or economic or international relations, or in the need for inner philosophical or religious formulations. If the dream material is reduced by analysis back to the personal life and is interpreted as having to do merely with the satisfaction of the personal side of instinct, the individual will suffer serious maiming of his psyche. If, on the other hand, it is recognized that when the personal factors cease to hold the predominating place, the problem is being 
presented as one instance of a universal human problem, the individual can be released from the bondage of the personal to find a solution along larger lines. Through an understanding of the universal and archetypal meaning of the dreams and fantasies, a solution of the individual's life problems may often be reached both on the personal side and also with a larger significance in its relation to modern culture and civilization. For unless an individual plays his part adequately on this world stage, he will reach only half his development. His task in life is to fulfill his personal obligations and care for his personal needs and also to bear his share of the cultural burden of mankind. This latter task means that he must find his due relation to those impersonal forces which determine racial and national movements, both in the realm of external achievements and in the inner realm where principles and philosophic and religious attitudes are the objects to be attained. Perhaps the most important of these inner laws, which need fresh exploration today, are the masculine and feminine principles. These terms do not readily convey to the average reader any very definite idea. By principle, I mean an essence or inner law, not as a law that is imposed by a legal authority, but rather using the term as it is used in science, where we speak of the law of gravity, the laws of mathematics, or the law of evolution. These laws or principles are inherent in the nature of things and function and earingly and inevitably. Even in man who has rebelled against the gods, defying many a natural law, these things still work. But by his godlike capacity to harness nature, he has in part lost sight of his laws or principles. In the physical realm, he knows that he overcomes nature only by obeying her laws. But in his own person, he has, in not a few cases, become so entranced by his power to stand against nature that he has forgotten her laws. In the Western world, this is so in regard to the essence or principle of masculine and feminine. Not infrequently, we hear it affirmed that there is no essential difference between men and women, except the biological one. Many women have accepted this standpoint and have themselves done much to foster it. They have been content to be men in petticoats and so have lost touch with the feminine principle within themselves. This is perhaps the main cause of the unhappiness and emotional instability of today. For if woman is out of touch with the feminine principle, which dictates the laws of relatedness, she cannot take the lead in what is after all the feminine realm, that of human relationships. Until she does so, there cannot be much hope of order in this aspect of life. Many women suffer seriously in their personal lives on account of this neglect of the feminine principle. They may be unable to make satisfactory relationships or may even fall into neuroses and ill health on account of the inadequacy of their development in this most essential direction. For this reason, a woman's relation to the feminine principle within herself is undoubtedly of great personal importance to herself. Yet it is not only a personal problem, but also a general, even a universal problem for all women. It is a problem of womanhood, and beyond that, a problem of mankind. In the following pages, an attempt has been made to clear the way for a new understanding of this principle of woman. For unless it can be apprehended anew, no further step can be taken either in the psychological development of woman herself, nor in the nature of the relationship which is possible between men and women. Indeed, we can go a step further than that, for men also need a relation to the feminine principle, not only that they may the better understand women, but also because their contact with the inner or spiritual world is governed not by masculine, but by feminine laws, as Jung has pointed out in his two essays on analytical psychology and elsewhere in his writings. So that a new relation to this woman principle is urgently needed today to counteract the one-sidedness of the prevailing masculine mode of Western civilization. But important though it is, the feminine principle or essence cannot be understood through an intellectual or academic study. For the inner essence of the feminine principle will not yield itself to such an attack. The real meaning of femininity always evades the direct interrogator. This is one reason why women are so mysterious to men. 
to the man that is who persists in trying to understand a woman intellectually. Take, for instance, the case of a man who has elicited by direct questions all he can of his wife's reasons for a certain attitude or action and finds that there still remains an intangible something to which she clings as though it were of greatest significance to her. Yet he cannot guess its nature or value for it always eludes him. Naturally, he feels baffled. When this inexplicable something has been touched upon in a discussion between them, the man is likely to lose patience and brush it aside, carrying his point by the weight of his personality. But the woman, convinced against her will, is of the same opinion still, for considerations which are of supreme importance to her are in this way completely disregarded. The man under such circumstances feels her to be elusive and unreliable, for, from his point of view, the discussion had ended in a way that was perfectly convincing, while she persisted in acting as though entirely unconvinced. In a situation as this, the man does not realize that the discarded values form the very essence of the feminine approach to life, constituting a part of the feminine principle or eros. For to him, these things seem to be but the outcome of moods or whims, impalpable nothings, which are best treated with a tolerant disregard. This woman was unable to express the values which were yet of great importance to her because she did not understand them herself. She was only aware that she was dissatisfied with the outcome of the discussion, for she was held by unknown considerations in an unconscious and compulsive way. Such a situation is not a unique one, but is quite typical. Women in general find themselves, when discussing any vital problem with a man, held by factors which they can rarely explain. The woman's relation to her own feminine principle is something which controls her from deep within her own nature, but she is often supremely unaware of what it is that holds her. She has no conscious understanding of herself and is, for that reason, totally unable to explain herself to a man and, even if she could put her feeling into words, he would not know what she was talking about unless he also had experience of the deeper functioning of the human being which would allow him to comprehend her. In seeking to understand the nature of these hidden reactions, we must renounce our superior intellectual attitude which considers them only errors, mistakes, or dross, and attempt to understand them in their own terms, for they are so impalpable that the intellect and rational analysis cannot grasp them. Even women themselves are at a loss to define or explain them, because they are almost universally separated from the very principles by which they are controlled within, albeit unknown to themselves. When intellectual acumen fails us in this way, we have to turn to unconscious products for enlightenment and see whether a study of symbols and instinctive ways of acting may not throw some light on the obscurity, for unconscious factors of the psyche are first sensed, not in concepts, but are perceived in the outer world, projected into inanimate nature, so that when man sees human qualities and characteristics as belonging to inanimate objects, there are not just arbitrary imaginings, but are reflections of his own unconscious qualities. When he regards natural phenomena naively, personifying them as in myths and folk tales or in the poetic language of art, he is interpreting nature in accordance with his own nature. His unconscious is projected to the outer world. In the ancient half-forgotten folk myths of a people, we find relics of archaic primitive ways of thinking which have been largely displaced in the Western world and in modern times by the more developed cultures superimposed upon them. But they are not for that reason extinct, nor are they without meaning, as is shown by the fact that they reappear today from the unconscious in dreams and fantasies. Through a study of them, something may be learned of those unrecognized laws which rule the unconscious where our modern rational and scientific ways of thought are powerless to penetrate. And so, in taking up the question of the woman's relation to the feminine principle, which is her mainspring, no attempt has been made to discuss the matter from a purely intellectual standpoint 
but instead it is presented in the form in which it is actually experienced by modern woman, as well as by her more primitive and less rationally developed sisters. The material taken for consideration and psychological interpretation has been gleaned from ancient and primitive sources and from the dreams and fantasies of modern people and portrays its subject as parable or allegory, not as rationally established fact. From a consideration of this widely disseminated material, certain characteristics of the feminine principle emerge, together with the laws which govern the woman's in relationship to it. These principles and laws are generally valid, and understanding of them brings out clearly the difference between masculine and feminine, a difference which surely needs restating today when so many men are womanish and so many women mannish. The symbol which, above all others, has stood throughout the ages for woman, not in her likeness to man, one aspect of homo sapiens, but in her difference from man, distinctively feminine in contrast to his masculinity, is the moon. In poetry, both modern and classical, and from time immemorial in myth and legend, the moon has represented the woman's deity, the feminine principle, much as the sun, with its heroes, symbolized the masculine principle. To primitive man and to the poet and dreamer of today, the sun is masculine and the moon feminine. The moon, first as an influence of fertility and later as a deity, has been considered throughout the ages to be a peculiar relation to women. It is source and origin of their powers to bear children, the goddess who keeps watch over them in all matters that primarily concern them. These beliefs are very widespread. They are to be found almost all the world over and persisting from remote times up to the present. They occur among the Indians of both North and South America among the Negroes of Africa, among the primitive tribes of Australia and Polynesia, among the aboriginal peoples of Asia, and the exceedingly primitive people of Greenland. The peasants of Europe have similar legends which also permeate folk tales everywhere, while the people of India, of China and Mongolia, of Arabia and Syria, of ancient Greece and Rome, and the Celtic peoples of Northern and Western Europe incorporate these beliefs about the moon into the very center of their religious structure. It would therefore seem that a study of moon symbolism might give us some understanding of the nature of this principle of woman, which has fallen upon such evil days of neglect and decay in our modern life. And so we turn again to the ancient differentiation of male and female, arising from the depths of the unconscious in the form of symbols, whose eternal reality is still exemplified to us in our everyday experience of the great light which rules the day of reason and intellect, and the lesser light which rules the night of instinct and the shadowy perceptions of the inner intuitive world.